And I think, I think, I think it might have all worked. <laughs> Welcome to Legends of the Maybe Drowned Isles. Oh, well, let's let's see what happens. Welcome to Legends of the Drowned Isles, Campaign 2, The Great Confusion, um, the increasingly aptly named second campaign of this homebrew D&D 5th Ed campaign. Uh, welcome, if you happen to catch this, either uh, live on twitch.tv slash ENCAF1 on Sunday afternoons, a few of the Sunday afternoons, hopefully getting back to a more regular schedule at uh, 3 o'clock, uh, roughly, on <laughs> Atlantic time on Sundays. Uh, lots of technical issues still face us. You can also see us on youtube.com slash ENCAF1. Look for Legend of the Drowned Isles out of the Master Playlist or the Campaign 2 playlist there as well. Uh, one word of programming note, I guess, today, uh, because of certain um, technical limitations, uh, we are going to be taking breaks every hour. It seems like weird to be a technical limitation, but we're going to take it as an opportunity for about five minutes. Um, we'll try to give you some heads up when that happens. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, I will be stitching together um, basically probably two-hour sessions. I don't know if I'll be... Uh, you know what? I'll probably post uh, each one individually. Uh, so it'll be easier for me, which is, you know, in the end of the day, that's something I have to take, keep in mind. Who am I? I'm Mark the Encaffeinated One, host and GM of this particular game. But I have, of course, my assembled players, the most important part, really, starting on my left with Silas. All right. Uh, my name is Pat. I'm playing Silas Marsh, uh, warlock of Mother Hydra. Hey. Uh, I am Marie, and uh, I am playing uh, Annie, who is a human rogue and very much uh, dreading. You, you, you don't know what, you don't know what you're dreading because you're... Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, Marie, you cut out, so all we heard was dreading. We don't know what you're dreading. Things. Oh. Things. <laughs> yes, that was the end of the sentence. Sorry, <laughs> uh, sorry Nax, please go ahead. Hi, I am Nax, and I'm playing Medrek, half-orc cleric, cleric of Ignis, who may have just found an accountant. And <laughs> that's true. We did have a recent accountant <laughs> sighting in the uh, in the game. It has been a little while, and we're not going to spend too much time on recap. But essentially, uh, the Circus Maximus has come to town. It's a celebration brought to the town of Aelthvater on the western shore of Escus. After nearly being annihilated by two different enemies, the town was under attack by one enemy that most people are aware of, that is the Sea Devils, the territorial, territorial sea uh, creatures who uh, have been known to attack ships on occasion, uh, especially small vessels, but for some reason seem more driven to attack more parts of the town. But the more invisible enemy, the one that the group here actually dealt with, was Taraz Nakma de Agul, the uh, long lost Athlonian. Well, it's hard to say what he actually tyrant. is. Uh, some sort of Let's inventor. Tyrant. tyrant. He was a tyrant in a historical sense, anyway. At least if this is the same person that goes by that name today. Uh, he had uh, been trying to revive at least one part, a gigantic arm of some ancient Athlonian weapon that happened to be buried in Silvermoon Bay, just outside of Aelthwater. But that, uh, that battle was won, and while he did make off with the arm, it doesn't seem to have been... Actually, he didn't make off with the arm. It crashed, I should say, uh, in, the, uh, in the chaos that was introduced inside. Uh, it went and sploot. It went sploot and then crack and then bang. It was very disruptive. There were large waves for a while. Uh, in, the, in the midst of all of that, uh, there weren't too many uh, losses of prominent people in the town. Thankfully, they were well warned that this attack was coming. Although one of the uh, most tragic losses was of the... Uh, the uh, wow. Uh, um, I'm drawing a blank. Medric, please inform me. Who was the, the leader guards? of the temple? Oh, right. Uh, Flamekeeper Tidewell. Thank you. Flamekeeper Tidewell was in the back of my head somewhere. 
who sadly uh, was uh, was lost in what looked like a very targeted part of this attack, perhaps a smaller battle within the bigger. You also lost the Temple of Ignis. But since then, in the intervening time, as part of the hope which brought back to the temple, or brought back to the town, Medric has since found not only uh, the wherewithal to rebuild the temple, at least begin, but also support uh, as the legend of the, uh, the uh, what is the title of the legend? The legend of the Fire Cleric, essentially. Phoenix Champion. The Phoenix Champion, thank you. So you guys have all the stuff. I, I, just a, I, I just got a hint at it, and you guys have all the stuff. I love it. But the Legend of the Phoenix Champion is brought about somewhat by Silas's uh, clever songs in the right places and persistent promotion has definitely brought some people to your side as well. So far, uh, with Circus Maximus, uh, the group of you have, uh, well, uh, played some of the games and challenges, a few in particular. Some of them seem to have very esoteric rules or maybe involved hidden challenges, some of which might also be considered cheating. Between the flight of the ferrets and the archery competition, however, it seems as though you guys have been having fun. A few odd things have happened, however, just as a summary. A mysterious figure dressed all in white was observed, both by Annie and Silas, moving through the crowds and around drunken patrons, apparently unobserved by any of them. When you tried to get closer, however, that figure seemed to vanish, or at least make haste and disappear. And Lysandra, a local bookkeeper, encouraged Medric to take a more prominent role in the temple itself and also volunteered to help, which means you may have found an administrator to help with some of the, uh, some of the management of the temple. Silas offered... <laughs> it's always good to have someone take the paperwork. <laughs> if the tax evasion hasn't been uh, evident that, to anyone. <laughs> as we should be right, clear, uh, is there, was are, are there are religious exe exemptions? No. For, uh, no. Damn it. No. <laughs> uh, the the uh, the taxes tax rules are pretty straightforward. Everybody gets taxed. If you have a business, you get taxed again. Um, Unless you're a member of uh, my town. Yes. The the, the 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 uh, town the of the cult just outside of the town limits so far has not been absorbed within the town. Uh, but you're just on the other side of where the Baron's estate lives. I mean, Nobody wants to you, creepy outsiders. I mean, you now own a business, Medric. Now you're going to be tasked yeah. four times what, what the original taxes were. Well, I don't know if the church is a business. Like, it, it makes sense that it would get taxed if everything gets taxed, but like, in any money? <laughs> I mean, yeah, the yeah, earth, there's tithes. Yes, well, there's that. Also, some temples do actually function as businesses. Um, they have rites and rituals that they can perform to uh, uh, to produce uh, specific paid services. Um, Plus, they get taxes to pay. They need to make money. <laughs> yeah. It's also that. <laughs> In addition to all this, this fracas and talking about taxes, Silas also offered to help some of the local pearl divers with some magical assistance in exchange for a small cut of the pearls, and also introduced them to his brother and cousin from the village, uh, potentially making some interesting connections between the village, the, the marsh town on the, on the outskirts, and the citizens of Elthwater. Dr. Marigold and Sandy, that's uh, Sandy Bell, have apparently enjoyed quite the evening together, quite the evenings together, as neither of them appeared the next day. Uh, in particular, Sandy was not found at the Three Bells, where the uh, Annie in particular still uh, makes has a room there. And during an archery competition, Annie realized that one of the competitors was none other than Sable Harquin, the Baron's daughter, in disguise. She caught up with a young woman and then discussed recent changes in the Baron and Baroness. And during this competition, Annie, uh, uh, sorry, after this competition, during this, this talk, Annie revealed herself to be none other than Lady Annalise, Princess of Alaria, which kind of, as the phrase goes, blew the wig off for Sable, who found not only someone who could actually understand what she was going through, but someone on the highest level of royalty within this region. Someone above her, which is rare. It's true, although Sable doesn't necessarily uh, 
parade around as a baron and baroness's daughter, um, more commonly known, but to many people as a shadowy figure that seems to skulk around town. As she has found a companionship or friendship or something uh, with the Diamond, a local um, rumored criminal organization, I guess you might say, also tied with the Shadow. So, after another day of rest and relaxation, or work, or potentially proselytizing, or whatever you happen to be getting down to in your downtime, another evening of free time rolls around. This time, there are a few other exhibits you have not checked out. Um, there has been some interest in, for example, taking the Griffin rides. Uh, a pack of griffins have been uh, brought in with the uh, Circus Maximus um, and are available to be, uh, to be uh, ridden for a, a small fee for another ticket. Uh, the ticket would actually cover all three of you to go. And there's also the uh, Professor Dudok Bitterhorn's Museum of Curiosities, uh, which has raised curiosities, both for some of the rumored exhibits that seem to be there, as well as just uh, an expert from somewhere else coming in. So, as you find yourself gathered at the Three Bells, as usual, um, you all notice that the spirit of the town has been risen. Uh, there are a lot of people who had a really rough time. There was a lot of rebuilding after the attacks. Uh, there were some people killed. Uh, and there were some, some injuries made. But the town seems to be recovering well, and spirits have been list lifted. Um, not only is there uh, music from the incoming performers, but also there's been more demand for music. So Silas, perhaps that's been part of what you've been up to as well. Uh, but generally, spirits are, are high. You find yourselves at your table discussing matters, and, well, that's where we find ourselves. What would you like to do, or what would you like to say to each other? Yeah, I mean, I've oh, I've probably been working, you know, like giving a hand with security over the past week. So definitely a need for it. Um, where there's clusters of people who are bringing out their money to spend, there are also people keen to cut those purses. And a few fights here and there, yep. some over enthusiastic drinkers. <laughs> So, Maverick would have been splitting his time between uh, doing work at the temple and, I don't know, just walking around, looking at the festival. Medric strikes pretty, uh, so like a pretty familiar figure as well, being both having glowing eyes, a slight yeah. aura about him, and also getting some recognition as the Phoenix Champion. Uh, there are many places where you've entered and a, a cheer will open up. That is until the Barkers take control of the crowd once more and direct their attentions towards the games. So the Temple of Vignus, because the, I guess would be like on reduced hours, it has like a kind of like a sandwich board that says like Temple hours, Monday through Friday or whatever the equivalents are in the world, like from, I don't know, 10 in the morning until 2 in the afternoon and then from 4 to 6. So do you still perform some of the traditional rites, the greeting of the sun, the farewell to the sun, for example? Yeah. Okay. It's unusual for you because you're you're more of a soldier than you are mm -hmm. a priest, but uh, those are some of the traditional rituals. You're aware of them. They would have been drilled into you. Yeah. I'm assuming they don't take more than a few minutes. Well, they can take as long as you like depending on how much you want to express your devotion. devotion. But they aren't very well attended right oh, now. Oh, hi, Ignis. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> With the greeting of the sun, there's actually, you know, not the fishermen themselves, the fisher, the fishers themselves. They would already have gone out on their boats for the morning uh, prior mm -hmm. to the sun. But those who work on the docks who would be waiting for the fishermen to come back, uh, those would have been some of the people who would start to gather uh, to greet the sun with you. Okay. Yeah, right. So the first one takes about 10, 10, 15 minutes. And in the evening, by to the sun takes like... Mm 
Maybe Dicks. it's not not from not from five until ten. <laughs> um. Okay. What's Silas been up to in particular? Anything? Um. Is this after he had talked with the uh, pearl divers? Yes. Uh, has he gotten a cut from them? Yep. Yep. Um, what was the cut size that you had been asking for? Nothing specific, just if they found more than they had been getting uh, t to basically give him a couple. Okay. Um, they have had a substantial success uh, on the pearl diving. Uh, and so they present you with five pearls which is actually still a small amount of what they had. These are, are relatively small pearls. Um, they're finding common ones at this particular point, uh, but they are finding them more abundantly and are able, um, with the blessings that you've given them and with the two, um, two uh, children from the village helping them, um, it's, it's reaping quite a substantial harvest. Um, so they've got a couple of handfuls, so about 20 or 25 at this point, but they give you five of those in thanks. No, oh, I thank them, and I mean he'll keep helping them. Uh, he will remind them of probably what they already know, just not to uh, completely clean the area out. But uh, they would know that better than him. So, and you also kind of noticed that even the skeptics among the group, there were a couple of the youth that were kind of skeptical. After the day is over and they've seen the success, they're a lot less skeptical. And mm -hmm. there seems to be some friendships forming between the people of the town and some of these youth from the village. Uh, good, because my brother was being a bit of a prat last time. He wasn't the only one, but yeah, it was it was a little rough. Um, other than that, I think uh, Silas has just been working on the show that he's going to do and looking for a uh, guitar uh, something interesting specifically I'm looking for a gnomish collapsing guitar so he can carry it uh, and would explain why the uh, the uh, neck of the guitar on the model I've got is busted um, so he'd be looking to trade uh, a pearl or two for uh, one of those okay doesn't look like anybody in particular has uh, the collapsing guitar just yet, but there's a couple of leads. Um, there are more merchants who are coming into town. It seems as though there's a big push that by the time the uh, party is on, some of the merchants want to have their higher end goods at the party, uh, considering it's sort of mm. a, a concentration of wealth. Um, there is one thing you discover, however, if I can find it here, uh, that... Uh, at the competition, they have sweetened the prize, uh, and it is to be a mandolin of illusions, as well as a portion of the, as the well as the door, which is the grand prize for the musical performance that night. And you're familiar Neat. with this this instrument, at least in passing. Uh, it has the magical ability to essentially illustrate what's being sung and under the control of the performer. Cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Ten minute warning. Well, that was quick. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that that's what happens when we uh, start late and start yes. early. Um. Yeah. I mean, uh, pretty much all he's doing, he'd be doing some advertising as well, just passing word of mouth to uh, come and see his uh, his his first big public performance. He's performed in public before, but usually only on the docks and the streets, and the and the uh, the bars. Uh, this will be a, a actual uh, big performance. So he's trying to hype up the the uh, town. Why don't we get a roll for the hype man here? Uh, let's see. Let me find my. Uh, there's my character sheet. Uh, what do you want? Rolled. Let's make this a. Let's make it a persuasion roll. 
Yeah, something I'm not actually trained in. Uh, <laughs> but I have an okay stat, so let's see how well it goes. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, okay, no, I so got to no, 20 so I can see what my... Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, you you are are making the making kind of the tour. You've you've played in a lot of different places in this area, and uh, the uh, maybe you have a small uh, handmade poster you can include, or maybe you kind of making note that while the big performance posters are the better, the big competition posters, uh, they basically uh, left space that could be filled in for the particular performers. And so maybe you've embellished your entry into that to make it a little more noticeable, hopefully not, uh, you know, sabotaging it. Um, you recognize at least uh, two of the other performers on the list. There's five in total now. Um, but you're pretty sure that the two locals, while they're, they're decent, they're definitely not up to your caliber. Uh, the other two you're not aware of uh, and you have a feeling they might have come in from out of town as a lot of people from out of town to come for this big celebration uh, maybe as far as Pitajun or maybe from the uh, local mountains with some of the you might have a dwarf to compete against you're not sure but word is going out and uh, a lot of people look favorably on your uh, on your performance uh, he will ask around a bit just to see if anyone's heard of those two before and what uh, kind of thing they might be doing. Okay. Uh, let's call it an investigation roll then. Just to see. Now, we're probably going to have to pause. <laughs> we're not going to take the full break, I think, this particular first time as we've tried to figure this out. That was a 22. Wow. Um, you've heard a little bit. Uh, in fact, very little has been given about the, the uh, particular names. I don't have them in front of me, unfortunately. I meant to. Uh, but the the two performers, one of them definitely is a big shot from Pitajun, uh, who's coming here. And you kind of get the impression that people are sort of aware that an outsider is coming to town, probably because there's a nice prize at the end. It's a good payday, as well as uh, this extra prize that's been announced is definitely worth it. You get a feeling they must have known there was the extra prize beforehand. It wasn't announced ahead of time. Uh, so definitely a big shot from Pitajun. But nobody has any idea uh, what they sound like, uh, except for some of the people who've come into town and have said uh, they have heard of them, but they haven't actually seen them. Uh, the other one doesn't seem to be from Eskis. Uh, it seems to be someone who's come, in fr come from uh, Alaria, in fact, and has traveled quite a distance to be here. Uh, has been known to perform for, uh, for established uh, or esteemed events. Uh, and even potentially performed for royal events as well. Well, I guess that's something that Silas will mention at breakfast, uh, asking if Annie recognizes that name, whatever the name may be. Yeah, I know I have the names. I just don't have them in front of me because it was one of the few things I forgot, to actually. <clears throat> that's fine. Uh, it can be. Annie, Annie can wah, give wah, me a wah, history wah. check. Okay, uh, I'm decent at those. Uh, maybe not. Uh, that's a, oh, maybe. Uh, that's a 14. Okay. You remember hearing the name before, um, but you were, you conveniently never happened to be in court when the performances were on. You had other places to be. And you were definitely there. But it is a name that is known to you, and it is a name that um, has actually performed at your parents' estate, has performed at the castle. And I don't have it yeah. in this document, so I can't find it. Confound it. But um, before we get too deeply into anything, we're going to do a refresh. Um, the stream will pause uh, as I do the refresh. Do not be alarmed. It should, only, should come back in just a minute. We're not going to take a break. We're just going to have to reset. So everybody ready for this? <laughs> it's like the I first gotta time. I got to go start the lawnmower for mom. I'll be right back. So I will take a two minute break. <laughs> right. Everything we'll, goes boom. Everything goes boom. We'll be back in just a minute. Okay. Please stand by. All right. I believe we're now back from our mini break slash technical interruption shouldn't have to have that for at least a little while we were sitting around the table at the bell 
at the Three Bells, and Silas was asking Annie about whether they knew who this performer was, who this uh, third performer was, or the second one for that matter. And Annie, I, I mean, was, like the, the name rings a bell. I think they might have played at court a few times. I, I never paid attention much. The, w- w- once them. you've once. Once you've seen one one performer come in, you you've seen them all. After a while, they 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 tend to be very play it very safe, and they all kind of blur together. <laughs> sure, I just wanted to make sure it was wasn't someone who might recognize you. <laughs> oh, that might be a situation that we have to deal with. By the way, yeah. I've never heard of the guy. Plays music. He's from out of town. That's all I know. Yeah, that's all I got, too. That's fine. So the name of that particular one is Turiel Menset. T-U-R-I-E-L and M-E-N-S-E-T. A half, uh, half-elven uh, man. M E N S E T? Yes. The one from uh, Pit of June is named Werther Lion, W E R T H E R L Y O N. And I'll fill in the uh, two other performers a little bit later on, two other local performers. But yes, Turiel Mensah would be the one to keep an eye on. Uh, again, the name kind of rings a bell to Annie, but it's not something that uh, that she's ever seen directly. But it is a name that has played at the Ilarian court. Presumably, if they're good enough at that level, they've got to be good at something. And you the said they from, were from Eskis, right? Uh, they are from Ilaria. Ilaria. Where Werther Lion is from Pitajun, which is the nearest city in Eskis. And is a big deal in Pitajun. Likely heard there was a big party and heard there were prizes and figured they can swoop in on this small town and gather some good prizes. So. Small town, there's nobody good there. Yeah, that's it's what you do to make your money. So what else do you want to discuss? Or what else would you like to go to do? I do want to check out the museum at some point before the uh, the big party. Yeah. All right, I should probably uh, go check in on a uh, name. It's been a while. Who are you looking for? Yeah. The daughter of the guy who hired us to guard his supplies. Whose name I, I want to say her name starts with an M. Give me two seconds. <laughs> Whose name I also forget. Yes, the date. Yes, the, the date. date. Two uh, seconds. So I believe that was Cartwright. Yep. Who was the person you were working for. And... His daughter was with you on the trip outward to see the diamond. Which, who, who we did not see at all. We just saw Knowles and the hungry guy. Yeah, and you met the um, the loggers from the camp, too. Mm-hmm. Who thankfully put out the fire you started. I have a drawing of that, that was, fire. I believe that was Melora? Yes. The mushroom club that happened in the forest. <laughs> Melora, possibly? That makes sense. I believe it was Melora Cartwright. Yes, yes. You didn't See, I'm good was... with the first lo- letter of people's names. <laughs> Who you didn't know was the daughter of Ardwin Cartwright, the person who had hired you. You only knew her at that point as the driver of the front wagon. But okay. when you all get back, you discovered, as Cartwright has given you an invitation to the party, and uh, Melora, well, he didn't put it this way, but there probably was a sense of... Melora's date. 
yeah. this, <laughs> this is the pro, the cost of the ticket to, to get to the party in some ways. Um, Wait, cost? <laughs> and you, you know, you do know uh, Melora is headstrong. Um, yeah. She's very, she's very uh, no nonsense kind of person. Uh, and she, indeed, what was when that guy's you were name in, again? That was Ardwin Cartwright. Ardwin. And his daughter, Melora. Okay. Just so the next time I go see him, I'm not like, hey, buddy, I'll, I'll actually <laughs> use his name. <laughs> he made me look it up, too, so that's fair. Hello, Mr. Boss Man. Hello. Hey, Mr. Guy. Hello, Quest Giver. Please give me Quest. <laughs> okay. So... You bring that up at breakfast or lunch or whatever. Yeah, this is. I'm like, all right. I don't know if I mentioned this, but uh, Melora invited me to the party, the ball, the dance, whatever it is. I see. Yeah, it and took I some know. doing. <laughs> <laughs> all right, was Silas the one who set that up? Okay. Yeah, yeah right. Silas was the one that set it up so that all the women were asking you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it seemed as though allowed. No, uh, it is it is fancy dress as far as you know. More details yet to come. Um, in fact, something Silas would have heard in his tour tours, and maybe Annie as well, from talking to different people. Um, it's actually not just fancy dress; it's costume dress. So you are expected to come as some mythical creature or some uh, some mythical person. There should be a story attached to your costume. Okay, well, I'm definitely calling Phoenix. <laughs> if anybody else wants it, I'll fight them for it. <laughs> you can pull that one off. Just wear lots of red and yeah. set yourself on fire. <laughs> Got it. Just, just You probably do want to remind yourself that curtains are flammable. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's um, right. Wear curtains. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's next? I probably... Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, I will make sure that there is a mask involved. <laughs> there definitely can be masks involved. It's like a masquerade. Uh-huh. It's like Masquerade Plus. Because not only fancy dress with a mask, but fancy dress possibly depicting something else entirely, possibly with a mask. So, you're yes. at the table. You're starting to talk about the costumes, potentially. You could talk about the costumes you might think about wearing. Although Medric has already laid claim to Phoenix. I mean, mine is already being made and was ordered by uh, by the captain, Verendale. I was I was like, no, that thinking of wrong name there. Um, so I, I I would say it's probably some sort of like I don't know fairy like thing because we were going with purple and flowers. Put a crown and be a fairy princess. No one will recognize you. <laughs> None at all. Um, so I, I, I would have like a mask and like filigree and very, very dainty. Um, and Silas could also be talking about his performance if he has something in mind and whether he wants to enlist his two friends to be involved. Or, if they're not involved directly in your performance, I'll be asking his two friends to portray the two locals who are going to be performing. Uh, yeah. He, um, Silas won't say it, but he doesn't trust them to sing and dance. <laughs> um, I... And he's not sure that Annie should be there if the entertainer guy is going to be. If there's a chance he might recognize her. I will let, tell you, I I probably have just as good of a performance as you. <laughs> you could Better prove that. just stand there and is just gonna his presence will be a performance because <laughs> people just look. 
And his yeah, Phoenix uh, outfit is gonna have like so many like Swarovski crystals. And I, I looked, I just Googled that right now. The melting point of a Swarovski crystal is 1200 <laughs> Celsius. And deep red fire is only 600 to 800 degrees Celsius. And orange yellow fire is 1100. So it'll the work. technicalities. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> I did send our like, like, our behind the scenes group a video of how to hide daggers and dresses. So it's like, <laughs> um, Silas will say what his plan is for the show is basically, uh, effectively a longer version of uh, the Rising of the Three. A an epic song ballad uh, about the rising of the three heroes. The director's so, cut. <laughs> uh, yeah, they can uh, they can be present if they wish, but that depends on how much they want to be pointed out. Um, if they're there, he will likely, uh, at the very least, uh, spotlight them. Well, no, because we're trying to get, so you see. Well, he'll spotlight the Phoenix champion anyways. Yeah, I'll be the distraction. Uh, you, know. <laughs> you guys do what you have to do. I'll just like stand there and flex in my brilliant glory. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, he won't focus on Annie because uh, for uh, reasons that are obvious. Um, but uh, that that's basically his plan is to do a big thing on the, the adventures we've had so far, saving the town and the giant arm and whatnot. And he'll be using lots of illusions. Um, Annie's contribution to this will probably be hyping in the crowd, like trying to get a wave of hype going. Yeah. Sneaking around going, hey, that's great. Uh, what's your mimicry skill? Maybe you can mimic some of the townspeople. I mean... Did I, did I say that? I mean, <laughs> I have disguise and forgery, so mm. like... Uh, it's possible. Just give me two seconds. I think that I actually have a thing for that. <laughs> Uh, that's uh, funny there's been five different people in in this room who've who've said what a great show this is so far it sounded like five different people from the same voice <laughs> and with the same height and that's strange um i because i think i do have something with the mastermind oh there may be an additional beat bonus there uh, Oh, yeah, I'm trying to remember. I think there's one for, yeah, if you study someone for a minute, you can mimic them. Something that. like that. Something like that. Well, we I'll, I'll find it that. and get back to you. <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, but yeah. That would be her helping in that. Okay. Yes, you can you can unerringly mimic the speech patterns and accents of a creature that you hear or speak for at least one minute, uh, sounding like a sounding like a local, basically. And I've spent a lot of time around locals. It's true. There are a few distinctive accents here. There's a lot of people who sail into the port of Aethwater, and uh, um, there's been a lot of non-locals coming to town as well. So you'll sound like people from Pitajune or even nearby Icro. Um, possibly up uh, further across over to the the the, uh, uh, the perfume reef. There's a few people that travel out that way. You could even sound like, sound like a triton. I'm very good at voices. You could even sound like a <laughs> triton, but it's a little harder to look like a triton, um, seeing as how they're taller and thinner than you and blue. Somewhat of a difficulty. I am definitely not blue. Webbed fingers. There are a lot of difficulties potentially in becoming a triton. So, as you discuss some of the upcoming things uh, that are just around the corner, where would you like to go next? You have, uh, Medrick has expressed an interest in going to see the museum, but not necessarily right away. Um, I think Silas... I'm interested like in the museum. museum and Griffins. These are the two things. She, she wants to fly. <laughs> she has spent a lot of time swimming. She wants to fly. Yeah, Silas is into the museum, and he'd like to go to the fortune teller at some point. Okay. What do you guys want to do right now? <laughs> Everybody wants to go to the museum, so let's do that first. Finish breakfast, mm -hmm. pay, and go to the museum. Sounds good. 
As usual, no bill is given for your particular table. Although it's not Sandy who's out front. Uh, It is uh, one of the other two sisters. But um, I should know their names off by heart. It's been a while, folks, to remember all the names and stuff. Wow. Sandy, Saffron, and somebody else. That's right. Although I'm pretty sure that's page one knowledge. Where is it? <laughs> I've lost page one. It's not as important, but I just kind of want to know all of the names again. <laughs> I want to remember everybody. Anyway. Sa- Sandy, Sydney. Is there one called Sydney? Uh, oops. I know there's one called Saffron. All right. Bye. To the notes. <laughs> Sandy, Sydney, and Saffron. You are correct. Hey. And it would be Saffron who's out front because Sydney's been cooking all day. And uh, while Sydney's got her usual disposition of of slightly less grumpy uh, than you might expect, um, she's still nonetheless not happy to see her sister not there. There would be that sort of snide comment of, well, at least she's happy. I just wish she were here. Uh, but again, no, no bill is brought to your table. You make your way down towards the docks where the uh, fresh bread has been docked for a while. This is the unusual ship, which is very large, about three decks at least of passenger decks, uh, a massive ship coming into port. One of the features of the Port of Aleswater is it's actually quite deep, and large ships like this can come in to uh, come into dock. Alongside the dock, uh, having rented essentially a warehouse that was underutilized. They've taken all of the additional supplies and things that have been stored there, somewhat to the grumbling of locals, uh, and moved it all into other accommodations for a period of time. There is the Museum of Curiosities, or more appropriately, as the sign says, Professor Dudok Bitterhorn's Museum of Curiosities. The uh, name uh, Dudok Bitterhorn is followed by a collection of letters. OGS, O-W-T, H-T-S, uh, uh, parentheses A, K-E-O-G, L-A-F-H-L, a parentheses V-S, H-M-E-O-T, R-C-U-V, S-T, parentheses D-A, and S-P, parentheses A-P, parentheses R. One of those actually stands out for, uh, for Annie. L-A-F-H-L, parentheses V-S. That is the Libritz Academy for Higher Learning, which is on one of the Alarian core islands. The VS, you would know, as you were drilled to remember all of the stupid titles that everybody who came through, VS stands for Visiting Scholar. And so you look at the rest and go, these are probably academic credits of one kind or another. You can see, too, this well-worn sign has uh, been uh, carved out of the wood. And as you look, sorry, go ahead. I, I'm I'm expecting like one of those people who's like, that that's doctor. <laughs> I'll just look at the sign and I'm like, is he trying to collect the alphabet? Yes, yes. Okay. He's some sort of scholar that has to put every single of his accolades by his signature. Um, Well, hopefully he can find X, Y, and Z. They are among the the most prized and difficult to get academic letters. (laughs) Since you guys are taking a look at the sign, everybody make a perception check, please. Right, how do I roll 20 again? I haven't... (laughs) Not 20. All right. So perception is... That 20 is good because you guys are not great at perception. I got 21. Dirty, dirty 20 for me. Wow, okay. It looks like so I guess today we are. From, yeah. I'm like well, trying to focus it's... on which letter is he not, what, what letter is not in there. And I'm, I'm like trying to make a mental list. Maybe it's the excitement of the moment. Maybe it's this unusual collection of letters. But you all spend a couple of minutes just sort of looking at them and... Uh, Starting with with Silas, you kind of notice that the the board itself seems to have been somewhat carved. Um, Looks that there's actually a bit of a pattern to the wood itself. Um, 
and Medrick, you kind of notice from the angle as Silas points this out, that these are very specific carvings. In fact, you step back a little bit and go, it, it looks like it's actually all part of one large carving that's sort of obscured as much by the letters as highlighted in the background. Uh, and uh, Annie, you kind of look at that and go, wait a minute, you've seen that before. That's a large eye symbol. Uh, kind of a, a, a tilted eye, almost. And Silas feels the ring on his finger hum slightly with energy. Hey, I found the letter I. It's it's hidden in there. (laughs) You recognize it as the shrewd eye symbol of Argenti Sagex. The same is on the ring that Silas is currently carrying. Uh, Is he wearing the ring or just uh, tuned to it? Oh, he's wearing it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Silas will whisper to the two of them that... uh... Uh, the ring just vibrated a little. Wait, what? I was... Expect strangeness inside. Uh, well, Annie does not have, have the symbols. book. It's hidden in her room. Okay. And the compass? Just so I know where Richard it is. Silas has it. Oh, that's on him. Yeah. That's carrying? Okay. He's got it in his bag. All right. Um, there is a, a number of people who have come through here. You get the impression, both from the people coming out the other side of this particular uh, uh, space, as well as the the somewhat substantial but fairly swift-moving line, that there's a lot of interest here. Um, for uh, Annie, it's a little surprising. There are plenty of museums to go see, and there's plenty of things like this that you would be normally uh, accustomed to. All over Laria, there's practically a museum every every few feet, especially in Libritz, um, where the academics have made made uh, museums out of everything. There is literally a museum of sticks in Libritz, uh, but they have a fancier name for it. In this case, though, and Silas probably is a little more tuned into this uh, this idea, this is very unusual for this place. There's a lot of people taking their kids in because it's probably educational. They're probably going <laughs> to learn something inside. They're going to see parts of the world they've never even imagined. Or Especially with the... Between the worlds. Sorry? Or parts of between worlds. If there's like these large worms crawling through the walls and shit like there was in the uh, House of Horrors. But anyway. <laughs> very possible. Um, in fact, you make out some. Uh, you notice a few people are coming out of the other side uh, excitedly. Uh, it is uh, a young boy and a young girl, accompanied by their uh, their father, as you recognize some of the Frey family. As uh, let's see, uh, it would be Henry and Esther are coming out. Uh, along with they're, they're, they're the lighthouse people, right? That's right. Okay. Esther was the one who has that one precious book that she's read more than once. Right. The one that tells the true history of uh, of this area. At least that's what it purports to say. Uh, Jonas Cromley is the uh, one who's been working the uh, lighthouse. He's the sort of uh, outsider who married into the family and has been uh, ever vigilant in making sure that the lighthouse continues to burn, even in its reduced state now, the, with the uh, smaller, uh, well, the smaller uh, uh, firestone, the, the, the uh, ignean rock that burns at the center. Although he kept it going with oil alone, uh, that now serves as the center of it. Thankfully, weather has been clear lately. No call for storm, no call for fog. And so they seem to have found themselves a few minutes to get free. And I'll, both, I'll wave at him. Uh, that Henry waves enthusiastically back, and before even <laughs> checking with his father, is already coming over to see you all. Uh, Esther's coming, coming with her father a little, little bit behind. Because Jonas did say he was going to stop by the temple, so we can discuss like ways to keep fires going. Yep. Uh, Henry Science immediately and religion is, mixed together. It's 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 a dangerous combination. Uh, Henry immediately comes over and kind of looks looks at you guys, uh, and you get this 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 sense of familiarity. He's excited to see you, but he's also just already excited. So, if anything, it's like you've just set the caffeine on fire, if you will, with this this poor young <laughs> child, uh, and. Uh, 
uh, he's kind of talking a mile a minute about seeing you, about seeing things in there. Not a lot of it is making sense because you get the impression that it was sort of overload while he was in there and he's just describing everything at the same time at you very enthusiastically. Um, Esther, a little bit quieter behind, comes forward, uh, nods particularly at, at Annie, um, just kind of, uh, she had bonded more with you back when you had met her, uh, partially over the book and partially over her situation, but she's also yeah. uh, looking happy, it was a, a pleasant experience, and grinning ear to ear is Jonas. Um, you can see that even though technically this was probably a day off, he's still wearing a tool belt. He's still carrying a lot of things. Uh, you get the impression that he's probably doubling up this trip uh, to come in. But uh, Jonas nods. Uh, good to see you all. You I still well. owe you that trip, Med Medrick. Sorry, things have been rather busy. Oh, I know where he's. We're working on reduced hours, or at least I'm working on reduced hours, and I'll just tell him what the hours are because I forgot what I said earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was like 10 to 2 and then 4 to 6. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to try to drop by soon, but it's hard to get away. Thankfully, you've had good weather, but uh, there have been some disturbing um, bending in some of my mirrors that I have to fix. Mm hmm. No more attacks still working from the Seafolk, though. No, everything seems to be quiet there. Good. Um, old Angus is um, <laughs> decided he's going to start standing watch. He doesn't sleep much oh. during the night, but he sleeps all day long, so that's fine enough for me. Yeah, so, long, so, so long as he gets the required amount of rest. No, I'm pretty sure he's sleeping just fine. <sighs> Unfortunately, he snores a lot. And while it's okay to handle while I'm asleep, mm. while I'm awake, it gets a little distracting. Yeah. This must be a welcome break, then. What? Yeah, and he kind of nods, and Esther is sort of rapidly nodding, kind of like, yes, yes, finally getting out of the place. <laughs> um, so, how was the museum? Anything uh, weird, odd, reality, reality breaking in there, or...? Uh, Jonas kind of starts to smile and Henry just starts launching into everything he's seen. If he's to be believed, there was something about a three-headed giraffe that seemed to come out of the ceiling, but that may not have been right. He might have gotten a few of those words mixed up. There's also a whole lot of plants and he kind of smiles and beams brightly as he says, and they can kill me. All of them can, um, which sends Esther kind of shaking her head and covering, putting her hand on her forehead. Uh, Jonas is still is going to smile. Got it. It's quite an impressive display of things. It looks like this bitterhorn has been everywhere. I haven't even heard of half of the things he's got on display. I'm hoping to get back in there at some point. Oh, please, now? Henry says. Um, maybe not today. Are you going in? Yeah, we're about to. How long is the lineup ahead of us? It seems to be moving pretty swiftly. It's pretty constant, um, as though they take in about 30 people at a time, and they're only waiting for a couple of minutes before they next take the next 30 in. Um, it It's a little bit weird, because you'd think that if they've got this place packed to the gills with stuff, it would be hard to fit that many people in at a time, but they seem to be having no problem with it. Hmm. I bet you there's like a dimensional magic thing thingamajig going on i keep that to myself dimensional magic magic you know the, the kind of magic i don't deal with <laughs> i know it exists but it's like <laughs> silas will just nod at things uh, you're probably right um uh jonas if you're going to be in blah blah blah, blah days from now uh drop by uh, the he names the, the place that we're performing at uh, oh, the theater! I'll Maximus. be doing a show there. Oh, I wouldn't miss uh, it, but it, I might have to. We've been we're trading off shifts at the lighthouse, and my wife really wants to see more of town. So it just kind of depends on when it happens. Understood. And Esther Why kind not? of looks up up at him, but I'm gonna go right. Of course. I don't know if uh, you guys are planning to 
check out the rest of the festival, but uh, I'd avoid that house of horrors. Uh, Henry kind of There's looks a, up some safety this. issues, let's just say. Henry kind of looks up at you. It's been closed all day. Oh, still? Damn. Good. Yeah, the safety issues, uh, as I've mentioned. And that makes Henry look even sadder. It's like the idea of it being not only scary, but dangerous is perfect. Uh, Esther <laughs> looks a bit relieved, though, Sorry. about it being still closed. Well, I won't keep you. We've got some more errands to do in town. Maybe a few more things to see. And Henry kind of cheers. But enjoy. I will. Will do. See you some other time. And they kind of wave and, and head out. Uh, out front, it is a substantial line, but you head in uh, within a few minutes. Someone is outside to greet you. A uh, let me see here. Boop, boop, boop. Boop, wrong page. A uh, gnome. Do, do, do. Where are you? Uh, a female gnome with light green hair that's tied back in several short braids that are all gathered towards the back of her neck. She always seems to be a, a very uh, uh, light and happy. You can see the light in her eyes as well. And uh, rather excited to see all these people, but also uh, one of those um, iron hand in a velvet glove kind of people. She's keeping them aligned perfectly in check uh, when people are trying to head in uh, when she hasn't <laughs> cleared them yet. She's pretty uh, steadfast about getting in their way and uh, making sure that they don't they don't break the rules. Um, something like a, a an iron doorstop in some ways because she's a little small. Uh, but nonetheless, the group that uh, she leads you in with. Uh, you pass inside, where you're met by a uh, a blue-skinned uh, young man with wavy white hair that seems to move almost of its own. His skin seems to glisten with, with water. Seems humanoid, but for those of you who've traveled a bit, you recognize it as a Janasi. Introduces himself as, I am Quareth. I will be your guide today. And perhaps we will also meet from the professor. He has promised to drop by. Nice. Lead, lead you through the different exhibits. Um, uh, quick question. Is he similar at all to a uh, Stela that we rescued from the water cave? Uh, no. No, okay. Stela was a uh, water elf, I believe. Okay, because I just remember Actually, she was blue. She was blue. Uh, no, the 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 uh, the water genasi seems to be um, kind of has this weird sense about him where uh, it's almost like watching someone who's standing in a wave that's invisible. The way his hair moves back and forth, the way that he seems to 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 walk and sway as he walks confidently, without not a swagger, not a not a, a, a drunken stumble, just more or less this this flow, almost as though he's walking through water uh, carefully. Um, and again, his skin seems to glisten as you see uh, natural water sort of beading in these wonderful patterns that form on his forehead and drip down his sides, uh, looking more like adornment than they do with sweat. Cool. The first uh, room that uh, he leads you into, and, and as you enter, you get the impression that um, they put up some artificial walls, mostly with looks like canvas, around the inside of this uh, this warehouse to redirect the flow of people. And then you kind of realize as, as you're going in, that's how they fit so many people in, is they've kind of segmented the space off into little, little uh, smaller exhibits that they move three people through in different segments. The first one is Flora and Fauna of the World, and it actually is a fairly large space that this opens up into. A number of live animals are towards the back, and as you kind of get your bearings, you kind of imagine this is towards the very back of the warehouse, because you can see there's open um, cargo doors there. A few people standing by the cargo doors who look to Annie's tra practiced eye to be some sort of guards. Uh, not not looking particularly intimidating or you know, violent, but they're clearly on the watch to make sure when no one gets in those particular doors. But they are allowing a steady stream of people who are coming in. Uh, looks like they're coming in with food or they're leaving with buckets of um, 
cleaning after some of the animals that are back here. It's a mixture of live animals and stuffed animals. The one that's most popular right off seems to be this rather strange looking bunny rabbit. It's rather large, about two feet tall, really, which is extraordinarily large. But you realize that the height is including this enormous horn on its forehead. It seems to be friendly, and certainly all of the uh, youth are gathered around it. It's a, it's a bit of a petting zoo spot, and it's introduced by, uh, by your, uh, your um, host. My, my brain just went left. Uh, by your host as an almirage. Um, any of you can make a nature role if you might identify this or know something about it. Silas will pet the bunny. It seems to be generally pretty, uh, pretty calm. Um, there are carrots to feed it, mm. and it easily eats them out of your hand. Nedrick attempts oh, no. to feed the bunny a carrot. I rolled a nine for, for a nature roll. Okay. I rolled a it, four. <laughs> <laughs> it's afraid of the fire hand, my bad. Yeah, the, you, you suspect that, that the heat from your skin does concern it somewhat, uh, and it seems to be holding uh, somewhat at, at uh, you at bay. In fact, it dips its horn and stabs at the carrot you're holding, flicks it up, uh, practiced uh, effort, and kind of chumps down back on it. Um, it you didn't will enjoy try to... Warm a, carriage, buddy. Yeah. Uh, you get the the impression from its eyes that it's sort of, it's chewing on it. It notices it's warmer than it should be, and it's giving you the side eye, kind of like, don't cook my carrots, buddy. Wow. Rude. Um, <laughs> I, want, I want the crunch. Something about fresh carrots, I guess. Um, for you, Silas, uh, again, it seems to be quite gentle. And it, there are many kids who've come in in this particular group with you that are all kind of ooing and aahing over this this uh, this animal. Did you make a nature check, Silas, by the way? Yeah, 14. 14? You've heard of uh, Al Mirage. They're relatively rare. Um, they are associated with good luck, sometimes to a fault. Um, people have been known to uh, sell Al Mirage horns as good luck pendants. But that probably means that the rest of the El Mirage was disposed of. Um, nonetheless, you do see some of the adults also kind of, um, with some exaltation, touching the, the horn uh, and closing their eyes as if, uh, as if uh, maybe wishing for something. But they are associated with good luck. Uh, there are a number of other animals in here, some of them less exotic. There are some, uh, some, uh, well, at least one large emu. You know there's also emu races. This is one of the competitive emu that's there. Uh, it seems to be uh, held back a little bit by the, the caretakers that are there, just to kind of keep it from snapping out at anybody. Um, it seems to be... Uh, a little bit jealous of the attention, though, that the Almirage is getting and will occasionally snap at one of the carrots. One of the people will be holding a carrot kind of haphazardly, and then they'll notice the carrot has been yanked out of their hand by the emu's careful neck strap or neck so strike. Like my dog. Um, there also is behind uh, some glass, you see a large worm that's sort of wrapped around several uh, look like smaller branches. There's a, 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 a panel out front, labeling it as an Asurian silkworm. Uh, the worm is probably about the size of your arm. And they also have an example of Asurian silk made from it. Um, this is something Annie would be very well aware of. Asurian silk is very well valued, not only for its beauty, and it has a beautiful sheen when, when uh, woven properly, uh, it is extraordinarily strong. And some have, have uh, made, in fact, pieces of armor out of Assyrian silk that they swear is as strong as uh, as a plate mail uh, armor. But they have only it's an example there. It's probably what it's probably uh, something that she would wear if she were to be going out uh, to a public event where she would be expected to have some sort of armor. It would be royal garments. Uh, it would be extraordinarily expensive. Uh, yep. The kind of thing where small villages cost less than a full uh, dress made out of Assyrian silk. Yeah. Uh, She's like, I have two. 
<laughs> Especially because looking at it, I mean, the, the, the silkworm is not moving fast. So the amount of, of uh, silk that it produces is uh, going to be a small amount. Um, once again, you know this is a highly prized creature, uh, and to have one in their their collection is clearly a sign of uh, how wealthy the collector is, uh, as well. Um, is Gideon with you, Silas? No, no. Okay. He uh, probably wouldn't want to have him around big crowds like this. Okay. There is a, a, a display of a colony of flying snakes, um, very much similar Aww. to, to uh, Gideon, um, who seem to be sort of swirling around in their space. It is a smaller space, but what they've done is sort of, it looks like an extended column going up about 20 feet, so they have a space to actually swirl around. And uh, there's a couple of other trees in the area that have seemed to have been imported. They're not growing trees, um, but they have the... the uh, a colony of them that are that are kind of flitting about various different colors and, and uh, shapes uh, and it does remind you of Gideon and they probably grew up in a colony like this initially um, they are a little skittish when it comes to people and you have a feeling that Gideon would be probably hidden anyway if he was here um, numerous other exhibits a lot of them are stuffed animals at this point um, there is a Parthen striped shark, but, uh, but uh, only the teeth, the teeth which cover an entire doorway. And you actually walk through this enormous pair of jaws. Um, Parthen sharks are known to be ship killers in some places. At least that's what the little label beside it says. Moving from the animals, you move into this area where there's numerous plants. And you can see now that uh, the... There have been windows opened up at higher levels to allow sunlight to pour down on, on some of these plants. Some of them don't seem to like it. Uh, one of these looks familiar, and you're quite happy that it's isolated by glass. Looks like a strangler vine, um, somewhat similar to what you've faced before uh, out in the wilderness. Uh, they are feeding it uh, mice, kind of like you would feed a snake. Another one called Illithid's Bane. It was a sort of long, gangly stalks, large, light pink flowers with many pe petals. Um, they urge you not to stand too long near them, as some of the uh, some of the <laughs> wow brain words. I knew words. Uh, the they have a, sm a slight narcotic effect um, from the uh, flowers. Uh, and they're well known to divert people uh, from the pathway through the woods that they've taken. Uh, said, however, to have uh, some positive effects on the mind, if practiced carefully. Um, another glass... Oh, it's it's drugs. <laughs> <laughs> another uh, glass case, and it's, this time you see the glass on the inside seems to have been uh, hit with some sort of mucus. And as you're standing there, you see this sort of tulip-shaped uh, plant kind of swing its flower around and emit this mucus onto it. Uh, the common name of this is called a spitting tulip, or tuapoa, uh, found native to uh, Isuria, actually, where that large worm was. Um, native to Partha is the Wahihi, or Mesmer Blue, a blue... Uh, a blue rose-like thing, um, which uh, you actually notice as one of the adults standing in front of it sort of starts to stand and still and sort of sway. And you notice your guide pull out a small bell and just ring the bell and suddenly they wake up. Uh, very dangerous. Do not stare at it. It will keep you uh, entranced for a while, but the Sound of a bell will ring you out of this, so to speak. And finally, there is a display of black roses. And you can see as, as, as uh, what looks like water drips from some of the, uh, some of the petals of the rose, little, little tss of, uh, of burning as it hits the floor, um, listed as Zentraxin roses, uh, cultivated, uh, according to the little card, 
by uh, the on the spot where the great black dragon Zentraxin, Zentraxin died, said to have taken on a very unusual um, uh, quality known to protect people from acid as well as emit it. Moving through, there's another exhibit. I won't go through the details of each of these exhibits. I want to give you a flavor first. Uh, there's an entire exhibit dedicated to exotic rocks. They have one rock, which they keep at least four feet away from everyone. It has a label of thunk on the bottom, T-H-N-K. They say that uh, uh, the island of thunk was... As one of the legends says, uh, was uh, brought the ire of Ignis and was rained down upon for a generation by rocks from the sky, making the entire surface of it unlivable. But the rocks have taken on a very unique trait. All right, we've got to go to Thunk at some point. <laughs> is Thunk, whatever. They are asking, <laughs> Thunk is where... Uh... That's where awesome. Adam's dwarven yeah. character came from, the one who was highly superstitious uh, and was very much afraid of what the stars were going to tell us. Yes. And had an armor remember. made of sunstone. And had, yes. Well, it was armor made of the stone of thunk. Star, star stone. Star stone, right. which was cold uh, sunstone. It was mined from the surface. Ten minutes. Ten minute warning? All right. Um, I'll just describe another room and then we'll move. Do I feel the power of Ignis in that stone, by the way? Um, you do, but in a weird way. Um, it's as opposed to a, sun, a star stone, as opposed to a sunstone, uh, mm -hmm. it, it feels more like the absence of Ignis than Ignis, Ignis itself. You can definitely okay. feel the power that had coursed through it and the remnants that are still there. But unlike uh, Ignis, which brings you sort of warmth and recognition and and uh, and uh, comfort, this affair feels almost like a void. Um, like it's 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 not only black stone; it's darker than dark in a way to your perceptions. Okay. Um, and you kind of get the impression, too, if the story is true, and it's hard to say some of these historical stories are also hysterical stories. But if this was an island that was essentially cursed by Ignis, this is the wrath of Ignis, not the gift. Okay. Uh, but somehow they've turned it into their own their own gift and are able to use it. Um, the next room is called the Hall of the Gods. And I'll have each of you make a perception check for this last thing to notice, and then we'll take a quick break. We'll be back after the break. But a quick perception check. Actually, sorry, make a religion check. Uh, do it that way. I, I, I mean, my brain is like, I can see everything. Hey, nat 20, so 22 total. That's a second nat 20 for me for Holy that, moly. so it's 21. The okay. dice are loaded. I like this. Yeah. It's on a different die, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on roll 20, so I can't be cheating. <laughs> And from Silas? Oh, that's fine. He's He doesn't have any training in religion. Okay. Their natural 20s should be enough. <laughs> um, it's quite a substantial exhibit that's really displaying some of the the holy symbols of each of the places. For example, there's a, a miniature version of a Tandu arch. Um, there is a, a minuscule, and Medrick knows it's actually authentic, a minuscule star stone. Uh, about the size of your smallest thumbnail, or smallest fin fingernail. But it glows very, very intensely. Um, and it gives you some sense that each of these is probably actually an authentic uh, symbol. Um, there is, uh, from from left to right, you can see the small star stone of Ignis. Uh, you see a thimble full of water that moves on its own, described as the symbol of Marina. Uh, you see a coin, which, as you're watching it, changes from heads to tails, which is the symbol of Marius, one of the many symbols of Marius. 
there is a small white stone. It's a perfect cube. It looks as though uh, you could fall into this cube because it's almost indistinguishable edges. Even though the, the light is um, basically lantern light in here, it seems to be always perfectly lit from every angle, even if there's no light on it. Described as a symbol of Namazni, the Tandu arch, and then uh, a, a, uh, a flower which seems to, uh, to ever bloom. It seems to bloom and then fade and then bloom immediately again, a symbol of Fala Lily. But as you're looking at this, uh, and there's another display behind it of, of some minor, uh, they, they don't label them as gods, but essentially they would be minor gods. Uh, but as the two of you are looking at that, um, you're both struck by the feeling that there's a gap missing between Marius and Nemazani there's another space there. You can't see it, but you can sort of feel it. There's a logical balance, which is off perhaps, or or maybe something isn't quite lining up in the way that it's all, all laid out. And both of you sort of reflect upon uh, Catherine's words about a dead god and how its presence can still weirdly sometimes be felt, but also is dwindling and must intentionally be dwindled if the world is to survive. And in that moment, there's sort of a feeling of, of the significance of some of the things you've, you've uh, heard so far. Uh, and from the back it's of the room... It's a moment where things feel, feel real. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there are a couple of other minor gods, like Entepi, that's the god of wine. Not always worshipped, but uh, wineries tend to use Entepi's symbol. Screwtop, the god of constructs. These don't have particular symbols. They're more of uh, a, or they have symbols rather than actual uh, representation. Uh, there's Old Fen, the goddess of nature, represented by a cluster of, of what look like dying weeds, but they're continually there. I didn't there. know Old Fen was named after a, a minor god. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one that all of you recognize, uh, which is a, uh, a large, uh, what looks to be like a large acorn, labeled Azamunta, with a subtitle, The World Tree, which you are familiar of. And hey. uh, one which seems to be a, uh, a piece of metal precariously balanced on a sharp triangle, uh, listed as the Great Balance, or Soldoldas. Soldoldlas. It's hard to say. Um, and then you hear from the back of the room a very gregarious voice call out, Ah, welcome, friends. Always good to see people who are interested in the many wonders of the world. I welcome you to my wonderful exhibit. Uh, my name is Professor Dudok Bitterhorn, and I am very happy to see all of you. Silas, you feel the ring on your finger, practically buzzing with energy. Is it pulling in a direction or just active? Um, it seems to be pulling in the direction of the dwarf who's just entered the back of the room and introduced, introduced himself as, as Bitterhorn. And in, that, in fact, in that instance, there's that moment when you look over and your eyes kind of meet in recognition and you realize that among the many, many rings he's wearing on his fingers is another similar silver ring. Looking obscure to just about anyone except for you. We're going to take a brief break. Silas will just you say under his breath to them that uh, he's got another, he's got one of the rings. Can you explain that gap between Marius and uh, Mazdani, though? Two minutes, guys. Two minutes. We're, trying <laughs> we're to wrapping end. up the scene. We'll come back to the uh, scene in just a moment. All right. Uh, so be, 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 be right back. I don't know if that was the first we were on the stream or not, but we're going to assume that. Uh, some, uh, the cat is wanting my cake. This is not unexpected. Cats want it's things. It's buttercream ice cream, of course. Cat.exe is functioning properly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to, uh, to jump back into where we were. The Hall of the Gods, one of the other displays within the Museum of Curiosities, uh, has, uh, has shown you a few things and kind of reminded you of some of the uh, unusual uh, things you've run into, in particular the gap where another god would be, which you know 
is an intended thing. But the fact that on this display, there is the sense of an unbalance, the fact that there is a sense that there should be something there, um, raises a lot of questions. Why would anybody who's not supposed to know that this god has been removed even have any indication that they should be there? There's no marker for it. There's no plaque. There's no, literally no missing space in terms of an, an empty placard or, a, or an empty spot. But both of you felt that it should be there. And whether you brought that to the table or whether something else is going on, that's something to be determined. I would have Unless, mentioned it. I'm sure and also you Catherine's me- words. Yeah, you would have been talking back and forth just before this uh, gregarious voice in the back of the room introduced himself as none other than Professor uh, Bitterhorn. He left out the additional letters on his name. You get the feeling that he doesn't want to take an hour and a half to introduce himself, probably. Standing before you at the back of the room, kind of entering from a different side, is the eponymous Professor Bitterhorn. Um... He is a dwarf. He looks to be middle-aged for a dwarf, which at this point really only means that uh, he doesn't have uh, any signs of of gray or or, uh, or white hair in his beard and mustache. Both of them, in fact, seem to be well coiffed, red in color, mixed in with uh, the beard and in uh, in his hair as well. Are complicated patterns of interwoven rings of gold, silver, and opalescent pearls. He uh, looks around the room with a bright uh, smile and piercing cyan eyes uh, at all of you and starts to kind of introduce himself to each person, uh, kind of asking them a question or two about how they're enjoying the exhibit. Was there something that they had uh, particularly found interesting uh, and so forth moving through the space? Eventually finding himself in front of, uh, oh, I just realized uh, Annie and Medrick have gotten mixed up here, so I gotta do a oh. little bit of. This is the other technical problems of what we're dealing with. All right, uh, finding himself because I looked up and went to say uh, uh, Annie, and then realized Medrick was standing in front of me. So instead, it's gonna be Medrick that he stands in front of. First, extends his hand uh, and looks up at you with bright eyes. And who might you be, sir? You seem somewhat familiar. Ah, let me guess. I'm Medrick. Ah, by the warmth of your palm and by the general stature, I can tell you're someone of importance. I believe you have another title. It was the the champion, right? The Phoenix champion, yes? Yeah, I didn't make that up. Uh, you can thank my friend Silas here for that, but um, I guess it stuck. So here I am, a, the Phoenix champion. <laughs> a suitable title for a... He looks at you kind of a little shrewdly. Kamar, if I haven't missed my guess. Yes? That's correct. It's been a while since I've studied the the uh, hierarchy of the Temple of Ignis, but your kind are well respected, if rather rare. Good to meet you. You as well. Uh, your exhibit is is really nice. Oh, it's it's merely my way of giving to the world all the wonderful things that I've had a chance to see. Omisha is full of delightful things. Sometimes are harder to find and understand than others, but this small exhibit is at least part of what I can show. Uh, just question to the DM: Is there like a physical gap between the uh, Marius and Nemozini uh, you would, displays? You, you kind of get the impression that it's not so much that there's a, a, a larger than normal gap, more that. It's not the same spacing that everybody else, everything else has. Um, it's, 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 it's like there's like a, a, a like kink in the flow. Okay. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Turns- a hypothetical question I'll ask to uh, Professor Betterhorn. Oh, I love those. There seems to be a gap. Well, not a gap, but a. Like, if you look at that exhibit, there's like a bit of a break in between the Marius and the Nemozini displays. So the, hypo- the hypothetical question is, would it be possible for an unknown god or a dead god to have existed? He looks at you with uh, a bit of surprise. It's such a, a complicated question. 
uh, and kind of uh, furrows his brow for a moment. Yeah, it's I like see there's that... a, a, a jump, a kink, something not quite there. Hmm. Well, I see that at least within the Temple of Ignis, they've not skimped on their religious studies. Uh, but you, miss, I'm less familiar with you. You're not, you're not from the temple. Let's see, let's see. And he, he uh, reaches out to, to hold your hand uh, and kind of takes it in his, in his rather broad. And you notice that his hands are, are, are academics' hands. He's probably done some hard work, but it's probably been a long time since these hands have done anything which have calloused them too heavily. He takes your hand quite gently into, into his own and kind of uh, holds it uh, uh, out, as always examining it. Indeed. Indeed. Well, you've had quite a story yourself, I'm sure, Miss. Um, your name? Annie. Annie. Well met. I, of course, am Professor Bitterhorn, but you can call me Dudek. As to your questions, study of religion has never been the primary among my cultural explorations, but I do admit in assembling this particular display for this particular place, I struggled a little bit with the placement of each of those well-established figures of the world. And I suppose, to address your question directly, uh, Sir Medric, um, there would be spaces in between all of these where other entities might force their way into the world. After all, I'm pretty sure that Screwtop was not an original to the founding of our, our universe, the founding of Amasia, but instead was venerated by our gnomish friends and brought into full existence both by the bridging of their belief and by the interest of an outside entity. Okay. And as for dead gods, well, such things are hypothetically true. I doubt that I should ever see that in my lifetime. You can make an insight check. As can Annie, who's part of this conversation. Insight, insight, insight. Plus five. Mm. What the hell? Nat 20. <laughs> oh, wow. 15. Okay. It's like all the bad rolls I was having for the past several months are just like the balance has switched completely the other way. <laughs> Boing. Well, we'll begin with Annie. Um, Bitterhorn's uh, manner is uh, quite comfortable. You get the impression he talks to a lot of people all the time, and he's used to talking to people of, of different educational backgrounds. Um, he's recognized something clearly in you and Medrick uh, of some academic interest, and so starts to be a little bit more florid in his language and a little bit more hypothetical. You get the impression he doesn't talk to everybody this way. But you also get this sense of something else when he was holding your hand and looking at you and trying to determine kind of who you are, as he did with Medrick pretty quickly, that he's intrigued by who you are. He senses oh, there's more to you than what he's seeing. Because he doesn't know and he wants to know. <clears throat> so <I> just... With... <laughs> Heavy with, Zach uh, energy going on here. That's right. That's right. <laughs> with Medric, um, you sense that he's intrigued by your question, far more intrigued than he would admit to. Um, he's clearly had a lot of thought about this particular problem. Uh, and while he's indicating these as far out hypotheticals, uh, that something like this can happen, he's a lot more certain about it than he lets on. You get the impression because he's also with a large number of people here in a mixed crowd, he doesn't want to say too much, uh, but but he's kind of slyly indicating to you that he would like to have a longer conversation about that. Yeah. Um, and he knows far more than he's, he's saying. And of course, uh, if you are... The companion of these other two, and the creator of the title of the Phoenix Champion, uh, you 
have definitely some skill about you. And he turns to Silas. Now, your nature is unusual. I extend his hand to you. Silas will shake his hand. Okay. This time he kind of uh, not only grabs your hand with his, his uh, looks like his dominant right hand, but places his left hand on top of yours. And you get that, that immediate buzzing sense. His left hand is where that ring is. And as it comes closer yeah, to your body, you sense this, this connection. And in that instant, he looks you directly in the eye. It's, it's only a moment, only a momentary instinct, or only a, moment, a momentary instant. But there's a recognition there. Um, and I would love to hear more of your stories if you have some free time. I'm sure you can tell me wonderful histories of this place and the recent happenings, which aren't yet in any of the books that I would have read or written. All right. Imagine uh, you have a few, you have a uh, an item or two that uh, we may have questions about. I should hope so. My collection is extensive. In fact, would you care to have a discussion now? I hate to take I you out of the rest the others, of. I, mean, I hate to take uh, you out of this out of this wonderful exhibit, but I assure you, you'll be returned back to it and able to see the rest of it on your own indulgence. Silas also makes very sure he gets his ring back. Oh yeah. And as soon as contact is broken between the two of you, that buzzing returns back down to a sort of background level. Also, being invaded by cat. Yes, she she has claimed her spot. <laughs> Discussion now or possibly later, whichever is the most convenient. I suppose you have a private location. Oh yes, I've set up a small office here just to make sure that I can oversee the exhibits and uh, continue writing my memoirs. I mean, I'm down for a talk if anybody, if, if everyone else wants to. So am I. Ah, then, uh, Korath, if you'll excuse me, I believe these folks are, we're going to have a small private discussion. They're scholars of, of quite interest. And Korath just sort of nods and quickly ushers the rest of the people on throughout the next exhibit. If you'll follow me. And he leads you over to the exhibit and sort of to the side around where some of the, if you will, false walls have been put up that, that are backgrounds to the displays. Uh, and uh, leads you to a set of stairs that leads up to the second floor. Uh, I've uh, paid handsomely to commandeer this particular warehouse. It's, um, it suits me well. Upstairs to the small office. And opens the door, walks in. Please, have a seat. While you might expect from a, a warehouse's office nothing more than simple bare floors and maybe a, a sturdy, squared-off, probably worn-out uh, wooden desk and, well, functional, if probably old and somewhat uh, soggy from having been on the docks a long time, chairs... Instead, you find quite a stately manner uh, in, in, in the interior of this. A rug has been put down, a, a desk that you notice has hinges on it, seems to have been unfolded into the space. Uh, and behind it is a nice large uh, leather armchair where Dudok sits himself and invites you to sit in three comfortable, rather uh, expensive looking chairs. Uh, there's a fourth one over in the corner, which is unattended. On the sides of the walls, you see that uh, uh, what look like bookshelves have also been similarly unfolded, almost as though they were folded in half up so that they have the books out uh, outstretched. Uh, and also around the room, a number of crates in which um, you can see straw and different items still in the crates, things that probably didn't make it onto the exhibit, or maybe things he's looking at right now. Along the back of the room, 
Uh, there's a small window that leads out, which gives you a little bit of light here. But you also see uh, a what looks like a, a large closet, like a standing closet with a thick curtain in front of it. A little bit unusual, but with the level of quality clothing he wears, Annie, you know he probably travels with a few spare sets of clothing right Definitely. on hand. And he invites you to come in and have a seat. I'm afraid I don't have any tea left from lunch, but I can have some prepared if you're, if you're interested or willing to stay for a little while. I've clearly got a few questions for you, that's for sure. And uh, closes the door behind you and has a seat. Well, it's not mandatory. If you want some, and if you want some, I'll have some, but don't I'm fine. trouble yourself. Um, I'm fine either way. Did Silas get a feeling that we went through a portal at any point? No. No. Uh, Everything here seems to be legitimately what it is, although, again, this room is decked out far more than you might have expected. He literally moved in and kind of took over the space. Um, The second floor also, where you, you sort of came up the stairs, it's normally just broad storage where they have boxes, and indeed there are lots of boxes here, but you kind of realize that many of them have been opened. This is probably all the stuff he stored his actual exhibit in is upstairs. All the boxes are upstairs, hidden out of sight. Um, well, I think I should like to have a little tea. Black Moss, is anybody interested in that? Uh, sure. I don't think I've ever tried that. And he goes over to one of the shelves and kind of pushes aside some of the, the the books and folds out what looks like a small stove, um, which he cr- he cranks on one side, and very quickly there's a flame which which heats up and he puts on a, pa- a kettle for some water. Uh, it will it will take a few minutes to steep, but it'll be ready soon. Now I hope you've been enjoying my little exhibit so far. I've collected so many things in my travels, so many interesting things. But you might know a few of those things yourself. And look speci- specifically at Silas with a question. Well, I quite liked the uh, snake birds. They were very cute. Yeah, he has a, he has one as a pet. Do you? Well, they can make quite nice pets. They're a little fickle and a little bit um, timid, unfortunately. I've never had the opportunity to have a space which has been calm enough for their particular uh, demeanor. But I assure you, uh, they are all very well taken care of. I run no terrible menagerie here. They're all very well seen to by... uh, by my assistance. But, uh, surely you have other things you'd like to talk about. Like your ring, for example. A most unusual specimen. Something I have not expected to find again. No, I didn't, uh, well... I suppose we thought that maybe there might be others out there, but uh, the only other ring similar to this that we'd found was broken. Indeed. Uh, sorry, I have to find my friggin' note that I wrote down for myself. There it is. I, he turns to you, uh, uh, Silas. Kind of leans on on the uh, the table a little bit, fingers steepled together. The water is starting to boil; hasn't quite hit that uh, that point yet and says, light reflects on water, but a person may immerse themselves in it. Make an insight check. All of us are just Silas. You can all make it. You're all there, you all hear this. But he is directly talking to Silas. Total 20. Total 23. It's not wow. about 20 this time, I swear. Wow. Medrick's on fire today. I know you not just literally. Hey. <laughs> I'm going to nine. you going to nine? Yes. Yes. It sounds like nonsense to you, Silas, and it seems weird that he's kind of taking this this breath, this moment, this isolated sentence to say to you, speak to you. Um, for uh, Annie, was that, you say a dirty 20? 
Yep. Nice. 19 uh, plus one. For you, uh, Annie, it has the uh, the ring of ritual almost. Uh, the idea of, of saying something specific to be, to be recognized. And in your case, Medric, it has the ring of ritual almost from a religious sense. And it asks for a response. But you don't know what the response is. He's okay. clearly waiting for a moment. Hearing Silas's uh, awkward answer, he kind of uh, uh, there's a momentary grimace that more Medric than anyone else picks up on, and then he kind of uh, takes a deep breath, smiles, and shakes his head. The water has hit that point now where the, it's boiling and the kettle is whistling. Ah, like the tea will be ready now. And he uh, uh, question to the DM: What was the light reflects on water, but we can immerse ourselves in it? Was that what it was, or? Light reflects on water, but a person may immerse themselves in it. Uh, and he goes over and proceeds to uh, spoon out loose leaves uh, into four cups uh, and pours hot water into each of them um, and then puts them on a small little tray and hands each of you one of them. Uh, Silas rather. again refuses. He said, no, uh, no thank you. Oh, thanks. Well, I'll have yours yeah. then. So I'll drink it. Still boiling. Because okay. that's what I do. He, Max yeah, just he, double fists it. And to be clear... Yeah. To no, be I don't clear, like take the whole thing. I just like sip it. <laughs> uh, and for those of you who might be watching, yes, I'm seeing the same uh, uh, non-moving from Annie and Medric as you are. This is another one of the technical issues we're dealing with. It, it'll catch up in a minute. Uh, but to be clear, the way that he presents it, he puts it on a small tray with all four cups and allows you to take one cup if you want to. Or in the case of Medric, you can take two. I'll uh, take one Andy... and then I'll take the other if Silas doesn't take it. <laughs> does Andy take a cup? Yeah. After I'm done my first cup. Okay. And he takes uh, the I'll last one. I'll let Medric take a sip first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can see that uh, Dudek is uh, not hesitant. It's more of it's very, very hot. And so he blows on it a little bit to cool. Uh, Medric, you have no problem uh, diving directly into this nearly boiling water. Um, the uh, black moss is strong. Uh, it's very, very... There's, there's an edge of bitterness to it. Um, he does ask after you already have taken a sip, uh, do, do, you, do you want any sugar? Uh, expecting that you might have, but you were obviously eager. Nah, um, that's good stuff. It, it, it is. You get the little bit of edge of the... Uh, of the, uh, the um, leaves in there as you kind of a little maybe a little too quickly before it got a chance to settle in the bottom uh, but you taste uh, those little little bitter leaves as well quick question would metric have had black moss tea before like in the uh, military uh, or is that like a high end like fancy item it is a fancy item but they would have served it to the military this okay. is both fresher and stronger than anything the military would have served you uh, in the military, it's basically we make large pots of this to keep our our, uh, our soldiers active or our guards awake, uh, but it's it's much 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 thinner, and it would have been the kind of thing where in the military you might have gotten yesterday's leaves, uh, but but this is clearly uh, a very good quality uh, and very uh, fresh. Okay, so let's ret let, let's uh, retcon the part where I said I've never had it before, <laughs> and I'll it, say now. Um, that's way better than the black moss tea we had in the military. That's for sure. Ah, well, it's a, an Aquanian strain that I've been able to purchase from time to time. I'm rather happy with it. Uh, but uh, it's a little too warm for me just yet. And he kind of sets the, the cup of tea down. Um, kind of see him blowing on his fingers. He was a little too eager as well with it. It's still steaming quite, quite heartily. But tastes quite strong and quite good. Uh, speaking of the military, the last war I think I was in was when everybody just lost their memories of everything. Did you feel that? Ah, uh, yes. I've heard it called a number of things, but the most colloquial and perhaps most accurate term I've heard is the Great Confusion. It's rather disturbing, to be honest. Yeah. And I've been investigating it in part, in my travels, that is. 
and he reaches into an inside pocket and pulls out a uh, a, a pocket watch. Uh, it looks like a rather elaborate pocket watch. It's about the size of his palm, uh, and he opens it up and kind of turns it to you. And you can see this pocket watch has six hands on it. Um, this may not mean much to you, but it was one of my first indications. You see, all of these should be roughly synchronized. Different hours, yes, but the minutes should be the same. And yet, well, as you can see, and he points to the watch, and you can see that the arms are all slightly off of each other. Um, they're, they're not lined up at all. The, the, the major arms are at regular intervals around this, this watch, but the minor arms are distinctly out of sync with each other, even to the point where they're starting to click differently. This is the time in six different places in Amesha. And while it seemed like an expensive amusement when I first bought this watch, now it seems evidence of something much larger going on. Something big happened and everybody's memory got wiped somehow. That's that's one theory I've heard. I have a few others myself, but what would you like to share about this? What have you learned about this? Uh, that whatever uh, was forgotten was meant to be forgotten. Meant to be and forgotten. And has to stay that way. It needs to stay that way. It's interesting. How did you come to know this bit of curiosity? I was going to ask, uh, out of game, were we sworn to secrecy about what Catherine told us? We're definitely not supposed to talk about the missing god. It's, well, okay. the, the part of the, the fra framing that Catherine would have put that in, if, uh, and it's been a while, so I can explain, but essentially, if you're trying to make something be forgotten, Telling people about it is not a great idea. Right. Um, the fact is you folks had already stumbled upon part of it. And so she didn't tell you anything other than more detail about what you needed to know. Um, but it wasn't that you were so much sworn to secrecy so much as when you're trying to keep a secret, telling people about it is not probably going to work. Right, right. But D Dudok looks very curious about what you just said. And definitely looking for more information. It's, let's just say it's where we, we figured out that there was a gap. Hmm. A colleague of mine had a very interesting theory. Unfortunately, he's, well, had a rather rough time of it. He's been dead for about five years, so far as either of us can determine. What was only slowing him He's only slowing him down somewhat. Well, he's having a rather hard time remembering what happened. And even the theory about five years seems to be somewhat uh, shaky. But Damon had this notion that the world had been removed of its normal time. And that something in that interim had been extracted. It's an interesting theory, and with some of my other colleagues, we've pieced together evidence here and there of um, well, something very big happening. Small pieces still remain, very carefully guarded, but I've not been able to put my entire finger on it. Some pieces still remained? Yes. Extra planar pieces, for the most part. How familiar are you, Mr. Silas, with that ring that you're bearing? I'm very curious as to how you came to have that. Mm. We found it in a den of gnolls. A den its of owner, gnolls. unfortunately, we believe, died or possibly became one of them. 
Yeah, speaking of extraplanar creatures, I believe that was one of them. In that Jeez. den, I mean. I know. I believe the den itself was extraplanar. Remarkable. Like, I'll tell him the entire story about, like, the hungry dude. I forgot his name, but the hunger. Mr. Chomp Chomp. Yeah. <laughs> Chompy belly. <laughs> Um, he actually listens and then uh, at a certain point holds up a finger for you to pause for a second, uh, reaches into one of the drawers on his desk and pulls out a, uh, a rather battered looking journal, swip, flips to a, a blank page and starts to take notes and asks all kinds of specific questions like how tall was it? Can you describe how far away you felt the effect? All kinds of, of particulars uh, and um which you can answer or you can leave out those details as, as, as you wish. Um, and about, was there anything else found with the ring? Or do you know the identity of the person who, was, who, was, who had it? I think we have the name of the guy. So for the, players, the for the player's reminder, you found a journal... Yeah, mm -hmm. as well as the compass and in its box and the and the uh, ring, and the journal did have a dedication on the inside of it. Yes, uh, and it was to, I believe, dwarven royalty or something like that. It was a dwarven family. Yeah. I don't remember the guy's name, but. Okay. I well, I mean, there's that. a gentry side guy, but I don't know. Notes interlude. The so, the dedication on the inside of the front cover was written in archaic, but it, but an incredibly uh, detailed dwarven square script. The dedication was to Gorfrir Riverforge, and it there said, "May you find the flow of stone." Uh, signed under King Goldotter, Master of Argenti Sagax. So, are you? Referring to those names specifically, or are you keeping them any any secrets back? What is your your stance here? Silas is fine with revealing that information. Okay, I mean, um, not better. Horn seems like good, he seems like a good dude. Uh, well, we're not. Uh, we haven't been hired to keep this part a secret, so no. this is fine. It's true. Um, yeah, Jose, basically that we found remains of a book and the ring and a stone block. I don't think you, I told you guys what it was said, if you guys don't understand Dwarfish. You did tell us, but you had left out a number of things. Yeah. Yeah, because there are more I don't know much about the book. book, I just know it's like an Elzara thing, so if she, if she, if she and Silas want mm -hmm. to tell him, let him go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think uh, she had left out certain things that made it uh, harder for her to press her case against uh, opening the portal. Um, There's a the fruit flag. I think the name mind. we have, though. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, Silas will mention that. He won't mention the compass specifically, but he will mention the stone block. Um, at the mention of Under King Goldotter, um, there is a reaction from Dudek as he looks with a very deep frown at the name as if it's distasteful to hear the name. And, um, Annie, you do re you remember or you know that the Underking was a essentially a rebellious faction among the dwarves to get rid of surface dweller kings. And there hasn't been an Underking in a long time. At least that's as the stories have told, this might indicate an under king has returned. Yes. Depending on when this was found or when it was lost. Um, and he kind of nods his head solemnly as, as uh, listening to all of this. Well, what can you tell me about this box? What can you tell us about your ring? Hmm. So you did sense it then. I wondered. It is um, hereditary. Rings can sense each other. I definitely had uh, some knowledge of yours being here. 
The ring is hereditary and honorary in a certain sense. It is something passed down through my family for a few generations, but as each of us who have worn the ring have discovered, it comes with a considerable amount of duties and responsibilities. Are you familiar with Argenti Sagax and its missions and goals? No. Hmm. Argenti who? Argenti Sagax. They of the shrewd eye. It's an old organization. It doesn't really exist anymore. I'm not sure exactly why. I haven't run across another person with a ring like that in a century, I think, or more. He kind of seems lost in thought for a second, as if trying to recall, and then sort of realizes you're still sitting there with a bit of a start. Uh, picks up his uh, tea now, sufficiently cooled to drink, and takes a pretty large swig of it. Hmm. Well, we're not certain exactly when the owner of this met his demise. It, that could have been a century ago, or it could have been a few years. The irony, from what I'm discovering, is both of those answers might be true from a certain perspective. It has been my lifelong journey to learn more about this wonderful place we live. Omesha has many secrets, many ancient secrets, as well as modern ones. It seems to be trying to keep them as it seems the rest of you are employed in that particular endeavor. The events leading up to the Great Confusion are mired, unfortunately, deliberately mired, and I've been having some difficulty uncovering them. The time anomaly was the first that I had discovered. And, uh, well, I can thank the Argenti Segex in some degree for that. Their mission, many, many centuries ago, was, well, a combination of protection and discovery. It was believed that the realm of Amesha was to be invaded from the realm far beyond. They were initially just a set of scholars set to map and understand various planes throughout existence. Dwarven, all of them, up to a certain point at least. When they turned from knowledge to defense, or even potentially offense, I cannot say. Much of our records are completely missing. But the detection of such incursions was part of our business. <laughs> You must, I must apologize. Most of what I know has been handed down through found pieces rather than individuals. No one was there to introduce me to the legacy. That's why I suspect it's been some time since Gorfrir here was active. Understood. But still, keep going. This is interesting. Well, I'll be reaching the end, edges of my full understanding soon. But in the time anomaly, the fact that these six times do not align, at least in minutes. Well, this peculiar watch is synchronized with six different places. More than synchronized, it's a magical connection. The gnomes who built this have, well, never explained it to my satisfaction. But they tell me that it is synchronized. And they also tell me that there should be no anomalies more than a few seconds every year. And as you can see, I now measure the anomalies in minutes. And so there's only one conclusion I can immediately draw from that. A considerable amount of time has passed in these different places. Upwards of 120 years difference. I don't yet know what exactly that means. Difference and between it, one part of the world and the next? In essence, the most extreme differences from the ones who've lagged the furthest behind to the ones who've caught the most up, if you will. 
this one. And he pulls out the, the watch against one more time and points to one particular uh, line. This one is unaffected, or should be, as it does not exist in this world. But all the other five do. And it can only mean to me that this world has been broken up and reassembled, perhaps to remove something. But I'm afraid I do not know what quite yet. No. <laughs> perhaps to remove that which cannot be talked about. And should be we forgotten. All, we also don't know what it is. Just so you know, we're not keeping knowledge from you. We don't know, and we've been tasked to let people know that it should be forgotten, whatever it was. You were tasked by someone specifically to help remove something you don't know. Not remove, but uh, in ensure the removal that other people did, I guess. Hmm. We are here to fix prevent, things. Prevent the memory, make sure that it's complete. I see. Like, I have to admit, I am curious as to what it was, but apparently whatever it was was bad and it should be forgotten. I wouldn't say necessarily bad. I would say just dangerous to stay. Whatever it was offended those with the power to remove it. Indeed. You you mentioned Omesha was going to be invaded at some point. Maybe whatever was going to invade invaded it got removed and now we should all forget about it lest it come back I have my theories as to why the war was raging you were a soldier were you not Sir Medric I was I just forget the war mm. like I remember the feeling of going to a war and then poof I was on a boat heading to Elf butter. No memories of anything. Sorry, I'm having difficulty switching screens here so I can look at my own notes. Uh, I remember forgetting. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> I've spoken to a lot of people, and many do not. Those of the ones, and he again holds up the, the watch, those who are the furthest away from, uh, the furthest deviation seem to have forgotten the most. It is almost as though the world is resetting them, itself around them. So I've been on the edge of trying to find where the further most locations have been, but even they seem to be somewhat forgetting I have a feeling that this, and he points to his ring, this legacy is one of the reasons that I'm still able to remember at least some things, and why I'm still able to quest after this. But uh, now I must ask whether one of your intentions while you are here is to remove my memories of my quest. Well, no. Our intentions here was just to see like, a nice exhibit. That is why we came. But you must see that your memories may put you in danger. Now, danger Existence. and knowledge is not something I fear too much. The existence of that watch may bring things to you. From others who... wish to remove the, such things. Hmm. Well... In other words, just keep it hush-hush. Hmm. Well, knowledge is dangerous. It will be interesting not to have to go seek it if it's going to make its way to my door. The but... basics that we were told was that what was destroyed was done so purposefully and for the greater good. 
and the person who ta- the the entity who tasked us with this is someone who did not want it to be destroyed. We did not want it to be destroyed. Hmm. That's a conflict of motivations, if I've ever heard one, but not but not outside the realm of academic possibility. Still, I was attracted to come here for numerous reasons. When the opportunity presented itself, I made my show available for this particular circus. But to be truthful, it's the most recent stories that I've been much more interested in. And the potential that this area might be a staging ground for another battle. I have studied the... Oh, you got that right. (laughs) (laughs) I have studied the Athlonians specifically for some time, and to hear that there was some sort of Athlonian relics discovered is rather intriguing, I must say. Um, Oh, right. There was a... Oh, yeah. Do you have a piece of paper? Apparently, if we say the name, bad things happen. Uh, Vazi McVaz face, yes. <laughs> is that just you not remembering the name, or is that you not wanting to say the name? <laughs> no, I, I have made a point of I always call him Vazi McVaz face in in character and in person because I I don't want to remember the name in person because I'll say it. <laughs> yeah, Medrick almost said the name. He said like a start of the first name, then it's like, oh, do you have a piece of paper? <laughs> I can write it for you. Silas will make sure you destroy that after. Silas will make the the name float in the air in front of the guy's eyes for like a second. Don't say it. Please don't say it. Uh, He he does read it and kind of hearing you with the cautions, he he kind of nods his head. That's a very old name. Vazi McVaz face. You can (laughs) hear when his name is said. It draws his attention. And you do not want his attention. So you are telling me that this Athlonian, this ancient, long-since-dead tyrant, is alive, then? In a, in a manner of spe- speaking. Intriguing. Intriguing. A floating skull. I wonder if he He would... tried to resurrect the giant war machine, or at least the arm of a giant war machine, but we stopped him, but he fled in the form of heard... a giant floating skull. I had heard this tale, but so many people dismissed it as uh, an illusion or something else of the uh, sea devils, I believe. Where did you hear it from? I've had feelers out in different communities. I heard it first as a a story told by a a dock worker being told from a captain who'd sailed from this area at one point. When I looked more into it, it... Hmm? Gaetano made it. I'm glad to hear that. It wasn't the name that I recall. Well, but, uh, the Sea Devils were on his side, and he did almost bring a massive arm of a construct to life. Intriguing. Intriguing. It all started with a vase that I found during a sea double raid. And I'll, I'll explain, like, everything about the vase and how we got in touch with uh, Dr. Mary Gold to explain to us, like, what it was. Then I said the name, and it's like, shh, chills. Uh, there have been names in history which is names uh, which have become themselves magical incantations. That was a trick the Athlonians actually employed more than once. It made them very good at being tyrants. Oops. Well, I guess uh, we renewed his tyranny. (laughs) I doubt it was the instrument that brought him to a life again. But in fact, I think... I think these are related. But... I feel like this place might be a little too... Um... A little too underprotected for complicated discussion such as this. If you would indulge me, I would ex- I would suggest a change of location. That is, of course, right if I can trust you. At this moment, yes. Sure. 
if I can trust you not to decide that I am better taken out. That would be a most uh, ignominious end to my career. Well, no, mur murder is illegal, and y y you don't seem like a bad person. You're just a curious person. Hmm. Well, I've been called worse, I suppose. Do I have your um, understanding and consent, then? I'll look at my friends. Yeah, yeah. Why not? We've come this far. Also, eight-minute warning. Yeah, I've got a, a button to end off this particular mm. moment with. And I think you yeah. might be the end of today, just because the way that things are going. Yeah. Um, what about Silas? Hmm. You feel like Silas he did ask just, specifically. Yeah, Silas is looking at him. I think that will depend on how the discussion goes. Hmm. Prudent. I admire that. Well, then. Then he kind of slaps his hand down on the table, stands upward, stretches a little bit. <clears throat> Perhaps a small stroll is in order. Reaches into his desk, pulls open the top drawer, and pulls out a set of keys and a doorknob. This will probably seem quite strange to you. I assure you it's quite safe. And I would also beg of you one particular favor. Mm-hmm. I would ask that none of you explain this or say this to anyone else. I realize that you've been drawn into numerous confidences, and that puts you in somewhat of a strain. In this particular case, uh, this would um, cause mayhem in certain circles to be discovered. And moreover, it would really ruin its effectiveness for me. So please, I would ask of you, uh, keep this under your hats. This the the key in the doorknob, or anything we discuss from this point on? Um, well, rather, where I'm going to lead you. All and he right. turns to the back of the room, where that uh, closet is, the standing uh, wardrobe, and pulls aside the curtains. And inside, there are indeed a few uh, clothes. Uh, he pushes all those to the side and reveals nothing but a blank wall across the back. He takes out the doorknob, and... You can't really hear him say anything, but you get the impression of a magical incantation being said, an activation. The doorknob glows slightly, and he pushes it towards the back wall, and it sinks in to the back wall. And you can see on the, on the face of the doorknob a brightly lit eye, the same shrewd eye of the Argenti uh, Sagax. It now is sitting in the door, or sitting in the wall in the back, and below it a small keyhole appears. And he moves through the different keys. Looks like a half a dozen keys on this particular ring. Each one seems to be unique, different shapes, different sizes, different materials. And he, uh, and he kind of holds one up. Yes, I think this will do nicely. Puts the key into the keyhole, turns, and the outline of a door forms in the back. If you follow me, we'll go somewhere a little bit more private to talk. Turns the key, or turns the knob, opens up. And you hear the sound of seabirds and the sound of rushing waves and a cold breeze blows through. It's dim on the other side, darker, uh, sorry, brighter than you uh, see outside through the window behind the back of his office right now. This wall, by the way, is the same one that has the window leading out to empty space behind the, the uh, warehouse. And he steps through, holds the door open. Watch your step. It's a little bit slippery. All right. Sure. I'll as, you walk, as you walk through, you notice there are stone steps down on the other side. And what appears to be an ancient uh, uh, building made of stone. Looks like it's thousands of years old or older. Parts of it have collapsed. Uh, and you stand now on a shore. The sun is higher in the sky than it was when you went through. Uh, welcome to one of my little abodes across the world. I can assure you... This one is his uh, ancient protections, which are still quite in effect. Where are we? I take it I felt that we're, we went to a portal. You did feel this as a definite portal. In fact, you, sorry, you would have noticed that at the very beginning of his, uh, his ritual. Um, Hemi. We are, 
we are on the island of Lithmon, a place called Agatha Down, long abandoned by my people, so no one will be coming here. But I've made sure to reinforce all of the different uh, protections, particularly those against being scried upon or heard from a distance. It's terribly annoying. But being in the academic world, you sometimes need to have certain um, privacy. Yeah, I suppose you don't want to get scooped. I mean, what was that that just came out of my mouth? I can assure you whatever is said is here will, will stay between us. And we'll have to talk about whether we want to make sure the world is sealed or protected. And that's where I'm going to draw it to a close as we have our, our hour-long warning. I think that's what, where we're going two to minutes. end it for the evening as well. We have right. Only two, two minutes to wrap things up. Um, sorry about the somewhat disjointed nature about this particular uh, episode. Uh, I'm very. I'm going to look forward to seeing what the recordings are like, because two of you have been frozen on my screen for about twenty to thirty minutes. Uh, I don't know what the technology is going wrong right now, but some technology is bound to fail. That's okay. We're doing fine. Back on to this, and we'll be back again on the tenth of October as well. So far as I can tell, we're going to hit that. Everything's fine. It's fine. It's all fine. Uh, the world is just ending and that's okay uh thank you for watching if you've been watching live uh i didn't pay attention to the chat room i apologize because all the other technical issues were causing problems but you can find us on sundays at twitch.tv slash encaf1 and you can also find us on youtube.com slash encaf1 look for legends of the drowned isles I want to thank my players for joining me tonight. Uh, even if some of you are frozen images on my screen, I can't see if you're <laughs> waving or anything. Uh, but thanks again to uh, Pat, Marie, and Nax, my three players. Thanks see for everybody. the emming. <laughs> see everybody again next week. Doodles. Two, one.